So, uh, hello, uh, welcome to uh, my talk on challenges and ideas in transitioning file systems to IOMAP. Um, so, so the, what I'll kind of want to cover is, uh, as part of the agenda would be like, just to kind of make everybody on the same page. I'm sure most of you already aware of IOMAP, but just kind of, I'll just go over uh, and brief overview of IOMAP. Uh, and then per block dirty tracking feature is something that we did. And so maybe that would help us understand uh, the metadata requirements uh, within IOMAP for, you know, for a per folio thing. Uh, and then uh, we can kind of go over some of the interesting stuff that has happened. For example, uh, what is the upstream conversion status of different file systems? And from there, we can start discussing and kind of brainstorming on to what we really plan to do uh, further. Uh, and then there are some open problems and challenges that I faced while say converting ext2 uh, and then I would like to have more discussions from you on that side so uh, uh, as an overview I mean IOMAP has more or less now become a VFS abstraction for providing your uh, logical file offset range to physical extents uh, it's sort of an iterator model uh, in that it expects the file system to kind of provide, uh, you know, operations that uh, IOMAP expect, for example, IOMAP ops. Uh, and then it takes more of a file system centric approach than the previous page cache centric approach. Um, the reason uh, why we say this is a file system centric approach is because we now first query the file system to provide a large extent. Uh, or kind of reserve a large extent, and then we iterate over kind of a folio, uh, you know, within that mapped extent versus the previous approach, where we used to first uh, instantiate uh, the folio in the folio cache, and lock it, and then basically call get blocks every time within the file system. So, uh, and then in this way, it also abstracts a lot of common page, page cache related operations within IOMAP layer. So you don't have to implement things like write begin, write end, um, sort of operations are not needed anymore. Um, uh, I will. I want to talk about a little bit of per block dirty tracking. So till now, IOMAP had. So uh, let me go back and a little bit. So for example, on a struct folio, you have. Um, uh, for, or for like when you have a large folio, you can have uh, different blocks within the folio. And so till now, what we used to have was just one up to date bit, which used to track whether your uh, block within the folio is up to date or not. Uh, but then we never had something like uh, per dirty bit, and that used to cause write amplification problems um, with a large folio or for systems with large page sizes. And so um, in v6.6, we got this feature merged as well. Uh, and I think at the same time, we got large folios as well for uh, for the right path within IOMAP. And so now what we can actually do is uh, not just know that the entire folio is dirty, but we also can know that within the folio what blocks are dirty. And so we can, at the right back time, we can detect that and then can just write the uh, required data rather than writing the entire folio. Um, and at the right back finish time, of course, we can clear all those state. Now, this is one of the uh, one of the performance uh, chart that was kind of shared to me by internal performance team who used uh, PG Bench as a benchmark. It is a mixed read-write workload, as you can see. And at the bottom x-axis, what you see is the number of threads, and the y-axis is basically your uh, IOPS per second. And so, what was happening was, as you are increasing the number of threads, uh, your performance was not scaling really well because you were you were reaching the max throughput capacity of your device, uh, and so it was not resulting into the user IOPS anymore. So basically, rather than writing uh, Whatever user was requested, you were writing more, and so you were kind of uh, the scaling bottlenecks were coming. And so uh, with the feature merged, uh, which is per block dirty tracking, uh, you can now see the scalability going well. And of course, this was on 64K page size system, but with large folios, I think this can be a common problem for others as well. But yeah, I mean, we are past that. So uh, let me come to um, stuff where we could discuss more things. Uh, uh, before kind of, kind of, Coming to open problems, I would just like to kind of uh, update uh, so that we again are all on the same page. So what's the file system conversion status till now? At the left end, you can see what all things we have already completed. Um, ext4 BTRFS was long done for direct IO to IO map, so um, that's already done. Um, 
In last LSFMM, I think this was work in progress, thanks to Matthew for large folio support to IOMAP. Uh, and then at the same time, we were also working on per block dirty tracking uh, feature to get in. So uh, uh, thanks to IOMAP maintainers, we, we got this feature both in v6.6 itself. And then uh, ext2 direct IO was also work in progress during last LSFMM, and I think we just got that as well uh, in the same cycle. Uh, 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 IOMAP multi-block mapping optimization is something that I think uh, Christoph has got this uh, in v6.9 RC1. What basically that means is that at the write back time, uh, rather than calling map blocks for each dirty block, you can now call map blocks over a range of dirty blocks. So basically you kind of have that small optimization there as well. Now coming to ongoing parts. Um, ext2 buffered IO for a regular file is currently in review. Uh, the reason why this is being done for ext2 is uh, is sort of a reference file system so that we can jot down any differences or any requirements that are required for, say, IO map to get in so that we can have other file systems converted as well. Uh, but at the same time, if you can see, there is uh, also a patch series from Zhang who has uh, pushed changes for buffered IO patches for ext4, but currently it only uh, supports default mount options options, uh, and it is also for a regular file as well. Uh, uh, along with that, um, IOMAP also has uh, one uh, basic problem with the file system which has indirect block mapping. Uh, that is something that, uh, again, thanks Matthew, uh, you spotted that. So that's basically if you have a block which is marked as BH boundary, uh, IOMAP basically kind of creates some non-optimal IO patterns, um, and so um, I think we have, I mean, I have submitted a patch for fixing that. Uh, however, uh, it has gone into a little bit more surgery. Uh, and so I think um, we have a simpler approach now suggested. Um, and we will be working over on that so that we can uh, get that thing sorted out for all the file systems which have indirect block mapping. Yeah, uh, And then uh, I think in the last LSFMM, uh, one of the key points that was raised was uh, no documentation um, for IOMAP whatsoever, uh, as in like you know, kernel documentation. We already have a kernel newbie page from Lewis. Thank you. Uh, so I have tried to go over all the discussions from various IOMAP maintainers, uh, code comments, uh, Git logs, and my own understanding of IOMAP. And I think we have submitted one documentation patch. Um, uh, once this is merged, this can be helpful for other file systems who are looking for conversions to IOMAP as well. Um, and just to kind of add a little bit of more motivation to uh, different file system maintainers, uh, obviously uh, we we discuss both of these approaches going within IOMAP as well, which is uh, buffered atomic rights is something that IOMAP can get, and large block size as well, so file systems who are converting uh, can get free of cost. And of course, uh, apart from that, uh, you already are aware the, of the scalability problems with buffer rights, but yeah, maybe we'll come back to that uh, in the later slides. And, and one final bit of motivation is that if you convert your file system to using IOMAP, I will stop bugging you about large fo folio support because it's, it's, it's there. Like XFS has no, there are no, no parts of XFS which use pages. It's all, like, it's all abstracted away by IOMAP. So folios, pages, you don't care anymore if you use IOMAP. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, coming to IOMAP file system conversion status. So the first line that we saw is what that really means is that all of these file systems have at least some operations converted to FS IOMAP. For example, if you see HPFS, that just has the file map operation uh, kind of used uh, as an IOMAP. And uh, the rest of the file systems below down uh, is uh, something that like even the legacy direct IO uh, is being currently used and um, there are no IOMAP sort of um, APIs being used for these file system. So what I intend to ask here was from a wider uh, maintainers and file system community was, uh, do we have any plan as such for uh, all of these file systems to kind of move ahead or is it like, you know,
looking for uh, legacy directory is somewhat strange uh, test because, uh, say, uh, MinixFS could trivially uh, grow that. It's just that nobody bothered. It's, uh, it's no different from EXT2 in that respect. So anything you've done for EXT2 can be trivially repeated there. They're very close. Oh, so what we are saying is we are in agreement that we can move uh, whatever file systems are not orphaned, basically kind of to move to IOMAP. Is that right? What I'm saying is that uh, uh, test for uh, legacy direct IO uh, artificially splits uh, uh, the set of file systems that are not really different from uh, each other in, uh, in that respect. So uh, uh, I would be interested in uh, trying to uh, say uh, take XT2 patches and uh, see what they boil down to on MinixFS, since it's even e simpler uh, model for. Uh, right. I'm, I really wonder uh, what, uh, how do you deal? With, would you deal with directories? I'll come to that, yeah. There is a discussion on that. Yes. Uh, for really interesting uh, one, uh, which, okay, uh, there is UFS. Uh, and there uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, seriously convoluted pieces uh, on the right path that just might uh, go away from IMAP conversion, but it won't be anything you have uh, analogs for in ext 2 It's uh, basically they have uh, uh, tail packing for short files and uh, real reallocation of uh, such uh, file tails uh, when file grows. Uh, it's uh, extremely unpleasant at the moment. Uh, okay. Nobody had been uh, enthusiastic about touching that, and uh, I very well can understand them. But it might be interesting just uh, in terms of what, uh, seeing what IMAP is capable of, uh, to see how it uh, could be applied there. Okay. Yeah. I might try to uh, do that if uh, I get enough spare time. Sure, thank you. So that would be a fun project. Yeah. <laughs> Not particularly useful for uh, anything other than uh, seeing what uh, IMAP can do and what might be useful to add to IMAP, if anything, uh, that might be useful elsewhere. But that's a, that might be a good test case. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Vito. Uh, practically, though, if you're going to want to convert this, if and if Al has this free time, who's going to test it? I mean, who's going to verify that this is... Uh... Actually, XFS tests uh, used to run on UFS. No, I'm speaking of UFS. Uh, reasonably well. Yes, I know that uh, there is no FSCK in packaged in and MKFS packaged in uh, anywhere, but uh, I do have uh, UFS utils uh, that compiles these days. Uh, so, to be a maintainer of UFS, it's fine. No, I'm so not. I was hoping that, like, you know, maybe. But, uh, beating it up? Sure, gladly. So I was hoping maybe like, you know, if somebody is interested in converting these file systems can actually work with their uh, respective maintainers uh, as well so that they can kind of get whatever testing is required for whenever the conversion happens. I mean, except that's why I also mark file systems which are orphan where you don't see, uh, you know, the maintainers. Yeah, I don't know of. about the specific file systems, but when I tried like doing some maybe API conversions in VFS or something, and I wanted to make changes to ecrypt FS, for example, just to to make things more in order. So it's sort of maintained status, but they have no um, time to to do this. So nobody's uh, taking responsibility on changing those file systems. 
Yeah. yeah. Ecrypt FSSK is somewhat uh, special beast in that respect. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, I would suggest uh, posting on FSDVL uh, saying that Ecrypt FS at the moment is standing in the way of such and such conversion and could somebody uh, uh, help with that. Uh, that might actually uh, get uh, people uh, grit the teeth, uh, swear horribly, and actually look through the damn thing and uh, figure out uh, what could be done. Okay, we're, we're staying off track, okay? So I'll move to the next slide then. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the open problems and challenges. So while um, I was converting ext2 path, uh, I found that the directory handling on ext2 uses page cache. And uh, currently, um, what I think ext2 does that is it uses block write begin and block write end APIs, which works on position and length bytes. Um, and then what I was thinking was that um, to kind of uh, counter that, we can maybe export IOMAP write begin and IOMAP write end APIs, and maybe have a helper function which can prepare IOMAP iter uh, so that file system like uh, ext2 can, the directory handling cache can still be converted. Uh, so that is an open problem, and I wanted to know whether that is the right approach. Uh, uh, maybe let me, let me kind of uh, go over the other problems as well. Uh, and this is something that was in continuation on the discussion that we were having in the LBS session. So uh, obviously, IOMAP doesn't provide any metadata uh, IO support. Uh, and so there were two approaches that are currently being floating. Uh, one is obviously, which Dave also talked about, which is XFS buff lifting. Uh, and the other one is buffer head surgery, uh, which uh, so. When I looked at Bufferhead, what I kind of saw that there were uh, four main things which Bufferhead was being used for. One, a reading metadata blocks, and so you have a buffer cache then. The second was it is also uh, able to track uh, buffers for tracking block size less than page size, right? Uh, so that you can have a state of which whether the buffer is new, mapped, things like that. And then uh, in ext2, you can also have non-inode metadata buffers which means that which hangs over your address space mapping i private list so that when the ext2 f sync happens uh, you need to write all these um, buffers before writing inode to the disk and then the fourth one is obviously um, buffers are also being tracked used for journaling so that you can do like which journal head and vice versa uh, so that is one open question again to the community as to does it make sense to maybe try doing buffer head surgery and then um, kind of use that? Or is it like XFS buff is supposed to kind of lift up for solving these problems? Uh, yeah. Hence seems to be a very happy for these problems. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just add a bit of uh, extra background there. IOMAP was never intended for metadata at all. Um, it was only ever intended, is this thing, it is on, yeah. It was only ever intended as data IO path um, for XFS. Um, that's where it came from. So the questions of how to support uh, metadata uses of the page cache and so on, never actually came up and it was not something that we tried to solve. So, that's the question of, you know, how, how do we do that? And is, is even IOMAP the right way to do that? Um, and at this point, I'm not sure that IOMAP is actually the right uh, interface to do that because IOMAP is intended for, you know, basically it's a block mapping interface um, more than anything else. Uh, and file system metadata tracking usually involves something very file system specific, such as the journaling um, or metadata blocks or the XT2 F-Sync right back, the, the, you know, the, the block listing and so on. Um, and that, they're functions that uh, IOMAP is not intended to replace or really even support. So 
I think that uh, that probably should be looking more towards a buffer head replacement uh, rather than trying to overload IOMAP into something that it was never intended to do in the first place. Oh yeah, I mean, I agree with that, that I am not kind of saying that IOMAP needs to support the Metallica IO operations only, but what I'm kind of trying to hint here is that, for example, ext 2 directory handling uses uh, APIs like block write begin and block write end, and what in, it internally does is for block size less than page size, it actually create buffers so that it can track uh, which block is what, and IOMAP already has that two bits of information, so things like these can at least be converted to IOMAP, is that something that you agree with? You could possibly do it, but uh, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure that that's the right uh, interface to do it. If you have a, an actual buffer cache, because um, what XT2 is doing is using buffers, essentially, for its metadata. It is actually backed by the page, page cache, but it is using buffers. Um, so, so there and, are two parts to that. Like one is where uh, that I mean, basically, ext2 directory handling is just using the page cache path, and this is all the same. Uh, you know, uh, like a normal file I/O, you use as page cache for that, and so that path. Uh, is something which I was thinking maybe IOMAP can handle that because it already does that. But yes, to to your point on whether um, for the other uh, buffer or metadata related operations, I agree that like you know we need not have IOMAP to support that. Yeah. So one of the other things you've got to consider is that lots of file systems have transaction contexts for their uh, you know for their for their modifications, their reads, their writes, and so on. IOMAP has no clue about that and. In certain file systems, if you hold a transaction open while you call the IOMAP functions, it will do a transaction itself internally. And so there are significant restrictions on what you can use the IOMAP functionality for um, in that sort of situation. So, um, like I said, it m we might be able to use it, but it's not intended and was never intended for that sort of, of usage. Sure, sure. Uh, if I might, uh, there are uh, two uh, uses of word metadata, and I am afraid that uh, this is actually confusing. Metadata is uh, directory contracts <laughs> for ext2. It's it's just a regular file with uh, specially formatted contracts. So uh, what uh, that code does is it's actually using page cache. Uh, it could as well uh, use, uh, well, we don't want to bother with uh, ICB allocation, obviously, but uh, essentially what we do there is uh, we read directory yeah. contents in page cache and we modify uh, the damp page, and then we ask uh, to write it back. And then there is another kind of metadata, which is indirect blocks. And yeah. that is a very different beast. Okay. So which one uh, do you have in mind? Uh, sorry, for which part exactly? Can you please repeat? No, so um, I'm talking about actually directories. Uh, then I would seriously suggest uh, treating them as close to regular files uh, as you possibly can, because uh, get block, uh, having get block in parallel with uh, IMAP mapping uh, is uh, very strange, and uh, especially if for uh, directories you are using uh, the current get block based approach and for uh, regular files you are using IMAP methods uh, considering that layout is identical yeah uh, that's uh, so that's why I was suggesting that like um, uh, for ext2 directory handling we can just have the similar IOMAP write begin and write end APIs basically handle uh, in the same way like how we used to do a regular file. 
and so that will also make i mean that also would mean that any other file systems who are using uh, block write begin and block write end can actually then kind of uh, use uh, io map write begin and write end and then i think we will have less dependency over creating buffer it's there what we really need is, uh, well, essentially we are using it as uh, not far from uh, use of a map, folding the stuff in, reading them, and then uh, modifying uh, the page we want to uh, we want to modify. Uh, I don't know. We definitely don't want to copy data from them. We want to access, well, if you want to parse directory contents, if you want to see search uh, for uh, entry with given name, uh, you don't want to start with uh, copying uh, four kilobyte chunk uh, into separate buffer and uh, poking there, and uh, you want access to uh, page cache contents. Hmm. So I'm going to disagree with you both here. I, I, I think we made a mistake in the 1.3 days when we unified the buffer cache and the page cache and we used the page cache for directories. I think we actually want to be using a separate buffer cache that doesn't alias into the page cache for directories, for symlinks, for that kind of thing. Because there's, there's actually a lot of metadata about your metadata that is, is just unnecessary, right? You, you don't need a map count for a directory, because you can't mmap a directory. You don't, there's a lot of examples. But what, what you really want, and I, I think Derek has actually done this, is you want a buffer cache. You don't want a buffer cache that aliases into the page cache. You don't need to bring in the entire 4K chunk. You just need to bring in this directory, because whatever other file system metadata is sharing this 4K on disk, it's probably not related to this directory. It's just other stuff, and you didn't need to bring it into memory. You can just bring in the... Wait, wait, wait. We, are not, we are not reading uh, uh, chunks of, uh, four kilobyte chunks of disk. We are reading essentially, uh, uh, we are mapping, same as we would for a regular file. So it's, it's not a page cache of device. It's page cache of file. It's page cache of the directory. And mapping uh, is precisely the same as for regular files and for symlinks. Yeah. But everything else is the same. <laughs> uh, uh, go take that with Thompson. Because use of uh, identical layouts for directors and regular files goes back at least that far. Uh, probably back to uh, Maltex file systems, but then you are going to take it with Thompson anyway because that was the group that was doing Maltex file systems. Uh, no, I mean, no, you're, you're, you're right, but what Thompson didn't have to do contend with was MMAP because no nothing out of their group does that. Oh, yes, they did because in Maltex that was the only way to do, of doing IO. <laughs> they didn't have read and write, but MMAP. That was how they did it. Okay, sorry, I, I don't actually know Multics. I, I've, I've only studied Unix from V6 <laughs> onwards. But my, my point is that the, the, the page cache really exists to, to make sure that write and mmap don't interfere with each other. And we don't need all of that extra stuff. We actually need like per buffer dirty tracking. We don't need per page dirty tracking. And that would actually, that would actually help a lot because that is one of the issues why this is such a problem with buffer heads and IOMA coexisting, which is actually what this is about. Um, what? Can you speak louder? Right, okay. So um, that would help, the suggestion from Matthew would actually help a lot because um, a lot of issues we have currently is that simply IOMAP and buffer heads can't coexist because both hooking up to the same private point of the page. And so you have to know, is this page now tracked by buffer heads or is this page now tracked by IO map? Yeah, both used for and, your private, yeah. And if we had the metadata not dangling off a page, which is what you're suggesting, this whole problem would go away because, well, then we would have something else to track and we wouldn't need to worry about what the page refers to. 
So that would definitely help a lot and would allow us to um, have buffer ads and OMAP coexist. Yeah, so so <clears throat> with respect to ext2 directories specifically, I actually we don't need buffer heads actually there at all. I, I believe we don't uh, even significantly use them there. Or, or we, like I can imagine we would convert that to IOMAP. So uh, as as Al said, basically we could basically just essentially treat modifications of the directory entry similarly as reads and writes, yeah, basically do the IOMAP requests similar to reads and writes. Uh, but yeah, whether actually that ends up being like elegant or whether it's going to be uh, more elegant to just let's stop pretending that directories are like, like regular files and let's go back to what ext4 is doing and you know doing it basically block by block in buffer heads or whatever re replacement we think that I guess we have to research. Like basically, in my opinion, I'm open to both directions, like either go with IOMAP or go with like whatever metadata block abstraction we pick and basically the code decides, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'll at least try the IOMAP approach first and see how it goes. And then maybe um, I also would like to see whether bufferhead surgery is something that can be tried and reduced down. Uh, so, so, so what really we were looking for here is like if we can make bufferhead something as FS buff and remove and strip down whatever is not required of buffer heads and maybe make it private to uh, something like ext2 to get started with and see whether that is sort of an abstraction that maybe other file systems can use. So that was one approach that I was thinking uh, maybe we can go with uh, and see whether that helps or not. So Can I ask something? Uh, maybe it's completely off, but is there any... Um cache sharing between when FSCK is run on the block device and then when a file system reads and writes the metadata at all? So no cache coherency issues there? Okay. Uh, so I will just uh, wanted to also thank uh, Jan, Ted, and Anish, who is my mentor at IBM, for a lot of mentoring that has happened. Uh, Ojaswin has helped in this work as well. Uh, and thanks to all uh, XFS and IOMAP and um, PageCache uh, people. Uh, thank you all for all the feedback and review comments that I've been getting. Uh, and obviously, IBM for facilitating this work and travel to ILSFMM. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was my time.